All right, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer this morning. Our Father, we are thankful this morning for the good week that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We ask your blessings now upon our class time this morning. I pray, Father, that as we continue our study of your love, that you'll speak to our hearts through the study of the word today. Father, we pray for the uh, continuing success of the Restorathon. We thank you, Lord, for the good start yesterday and, and all the blessings and all the people that have got involved. And we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to bless in that regard throughout today, today, and, and, uh, and tomorrow. And I pray, Lord, that, uh, that the goals will be reached and exceeded. And, and Father, I pray that you'll continue to work in, in the hearts of your people and touch them regarding uh, what our part should be uh, in, in giving to the, uh, to the need for this year. Father, we pray for, uh, for people that are hurting today. We, we, we hear of the, of the storms yesterday and, and uh, 15 students that were killed at a high school in Alabama. And, Lord, I know many families are, are in grief to, uh, this morning as a result of that. And I pray, Lord, that you'll draw those folks close unto yourself. And, uh, Lord, those that don't know you as Savior, that this might be uh, the impetus that would bring them to you. Father, bless throughout the day and all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go back to uh, where we left off in our last session, 1 John chapter 4. Go ahead and get your Bibles open. And again, I'll remind you, today's the, the due date for workbooks, so I assume I've got all of them up here. <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned the other day, your next one uh, is not due until, what is it, the first week of May, I believe. So, so we've got a little bit of time to work on that. But uh, if you put yourself in dire straits this time and had to burn the midnight oil and, and so forth, then don't do yourself that way next time. But... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, work on a little bit each day, a little bit each week, and you'll have it done before you know it. But there always is the night before, amen? Uh, and uh, I had a student tell me one time, I, I work best under pressure. And I said, your problem is the only time you work is when you're under pressure, amen? So, so we'll just start putting pressure on right up front. How's that? <clears throat> All right, we're talking about the significance of God's love, Roman numeral 4 in our outline. We said that God's love is significant in three areas. The first one we talked about in our last session was, of course, in regard to salvation, verse number 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Second uh, part here, letter B, God's love is significant also, letter B, in service. Here we're talking about in Christian service. Verse number 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we, also, we ought also to love one another. And uh, the idea here is this. We cannot truly experience God's love in our hearts and in our lives without it motivating us uh, to do something in return, that, that attitude of gratitude business uh, that we sometimes talk about. After all the Lord's done for us, we, we should, like the Apostle Paul, I taught a lesson yesterday out of... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in, in my seminary class on 2 Corinthians, and that whole chapter deals with this very same subject. And uh, Paul said, The love of Christ constraineth us. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And uh, tremendous passages there. We'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's all out of that fifth chapter in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And um, th what we're saying here is that uh, God's love ought to motivate us uh, to serve him. It's like the little boy that said, Daddy, I love you. And, and the father son responded, Well, son, I love you too. But that didn't satisfy the little guy. He ran over and hugged his daddy and kissed him. And he says, I can't just say it. i got to do something about it. Amen? <laughs> and uh, the idea is that a love that is real uh, will become a love of action. It's, right. It does more than just, than just say. It shows. Right. Write this statement down. If you love the Lord, you will do more than declare it you will demonstrate it in your daily life. If you love the Lord, you will do more than, than declare it. You will demonstrate it in your daily life. <clears throat> if you love the Lord, you will do more than declare it. You will demonstrate it in your daily life. Also get this statement down. God's love for us begets our love for him in return. 
God's love for us begets our love for him in return. God's love for us begets our love for him in return and motivates us to love others. God's love for us begets our love for him in return and motivates us to love others, which is the basis for service, which is the basis for service. God's love for us begets our love for him in return and motivates us to love others which is the basis for service. Just put a little excerpt out of a verse in the, in the Old Testament that speaks to that thought out of Isaiah chapter 56 and verse number 6. It says, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. And, uh, you know, there's a difference between a hireling and a servant amen a hireling is there he's on the clock he's going to do what he's expected to do if he's a good worker and he has a good work ethic but a servant sees more than just what am i told to do he sees what is the need and and uh, and what can i do in order to please my master and in this case in order to please the lord all right now let's get this statement down and then we'll talk about this for a little bit in a very real sense our service for the lord our service for the Lord and our love for God are inseparable. <clears throat> our service for the Lord and our love for God are inseparable. Our service for the Lord and our love for God are inseparable. <clears throat> now, we've talked about that before. Isn't that how it is in our relationships with our loved ones? I love my wife. I enjoy doing special things for her. Every morning I get up and leave the house. That's a special thing for her. Amen. <laughs> and <laughs> we love the Lord and we demonstrate that love by doing things in his name for him and for others. You know, we often think of our service to God as our duty to God. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we have commitments, responsibilities, uh, ministries, duties, whatever you want to call them. There are many blessings in being faithful to our duties. <clears throat> there are also some significant dangers as well in the sense that when we only do it because we're expected to, we only do it because we're supposed to, we only do it because we've got to make an appearance and keep people off our back and so forth, then, uh, and if we only just kind of go through the motions and don't really serve the Lord from the heart, then there's some significant danger to being involved in those things uh, with, that, with that mindset and with that position of our heart. Think about it like this. Here's the average Christian facing his duty to God. Maybe it's a bus route. Maybe it's uh, a Sunday school class. Maybe it's singing in the choir. A, n a number of possibilities, whatever it might be in the, in the local church ministries. At first, that Christian takes on that duty, uh, you know, and that responsibility, that opportunity for service with, with excitement, with tremendous anticipation. I mean, good night. What a privilege to teach a Sunday school class, to be trusted with the awesome responsibility of teaching the Word of God to others. Uh, praise God for the chance to be a part of the bus ministry and, and bring boys and girls and moms and dads to church and to love them and to be a part of their lives. But we've, most of us have been doing that long enough to know that it can become routine to us if we're not careful. It can become more than routine to us if we're not careful. And so the Christian takes on these responsibilities and he's excited, he or she is excited. It's wonderful to be involved in the service of the Lord. Things go pretty well for a while. Then over time, circumstances arise that make it difficult to perform those duties. Things come up, you know. Things come up that the Christian worker had not anticipated. Teaching a class or being on a bus route, if you do it and do it right, requires time. It requires effort, doesn't it? It involves work, a lot of work. And, uh, you know, the kids don't behave like you thought they would. <laughs> This kid in your class moves out of town and, and doesn't come back. This kid gets into a big fight on the bus and, and is not allowed to return for 15 to 20 years or whatever the sentence might be. And, uh, you know, there are problems with other workers. 
Uh, so the Christian worker finds themselves under this ever-building cloud of circumstances. And they didn't figure that serving the Lord would be so difficult and be so hard. So their duty to the Lord now has become drudgery to them. <clears throat> At first they resist the circumstances and, and, and they went over those things. But after a while those things begin to get to them. And so the weeks pass and the duty has become a dread to them and their resisting now becomes resentment but this resentment is not just against the circumstances but against the duty itself and what at first they love to do is no longer enjoyable at all so what happens more often than not they end up quitting and unfortunately it happens all the time as the bus director of our church and, and as a church Sunday school superintendent I deal with that kind of thing from time to time sometimes these people will come to me with a million excuses as to why they cannot continue to be on the bus or, or work in the, in the Sunday school or in the junior church or whatever it might be. Sometimes they just disappear and never say a word, you know. Same thing happens with Sunday school teachers, junior church workers, choir members, I suppose, uh, Bible college students. Uh, they have a little harder time getting away from me as long as they stay enrolled here. But anyway, <clears throat> I, I vividly remember a bus driver one time, it's been a few years ago, faithful man a good man uh, he drove the bus faithfully for several years and, and I remember one Sunday morning uh, he drove the bus in and uh, unloaded the children parked the bus got off the bus walked over to me handed me the key and said find another driver I'm finished and uh, you know just out of the clear blue just like that and, uh, and like I said he'd been he'd been faithful for, for several years dependable I've got to be honest with you, <clears throat> I always have a hard time with those kind of situations. I'm probably a little better at it than I used to be, but not always. Uh, I'm always sorely tempted to, you know, get in the flesh and tell people just what I think about them. But uh, and I have to ask the Lord to help me and forgive me of the evil thoughts I have at that time <laughs> with people with, with such a, a lack of character. And uh, you know what that guy's problem was? It was... Uh, it was summertime, it was hot, you know, central Florida, blazing hot, and uh, being on a bus, boy, that's like a sauna bath, you know, in the summertime. But uh, not as hot as it is in hell, amen? And uh, we're out there serving the Lord, trying to keep people out of hell. <coughs> we, uh, uh, the, the mechanic, uh, the bus mechanic uh, in those days, whoever he was, uh, we, we swapped some vehicles around, and uh, we had a problem with one bus that went a great distance, and and it wasn't the kind of problem that we were willing to put a lot of money into. It was still a good bus. We just didn't trust it on a really long run. So, so they swapped buses out. And so this guy wound up with a different bus. The bus he was driving that morning didn't have a fan in it right there by the driver. So that was just all he could take. I'm done. Forget it. Find somebody else. And, uh, and, and I thought to myself, you know, uh, not nearly as hot as it is in hell. You know, what a privilege to serve the Lord and to be able to drive a bus. This guy can drive a truck all week and make a living for his family, but he can't drive a church bus on Sunday and serve God. You know, uh, I'd like to tell you, I have a hard time with that. <laughs> I used to play detective and ask people, what's your problem? I don't do that a whole lot much anymore. I, I, don't, I don't beg people to serve God. Amen. I, I don't ask, have to ask them what their problem is. I already know. And uh, their problem is not the unpleasant circumstances. Man, there's always going to be unpleasant circumstances. And uh, their problem was a problem with their eyes, amen? They were looking at the wrong things. They had their eyes on circumstances when instead they should have been focusing on the Lord. And sometimes we have to do a little self-inventory in our own hearts and in our own lives and, and realize where is our focus when it comes to these areas of Christian service. We've taught several lessons this semester uh, about responsibilities and about you know the thing about the talents and all that stuff that we covered in an earlier lesson God will continue to multiply our responsibilities as we prove ourselves faithful to him and uh, you know and so we, we have to focus uh, uh, upon where, where uh, how we see those things let's put it that way in our lives today and if our service for the Lord has become routine, if our service for the Lord has become something that just any little excuse will do to keep from doing it, or, or you know, 
that kind of thing, then then uh, you know then we need to do a little heart check. And uh, do you do what you do because you have to, or because you want to? That's the idea here. Do you look for any little excuse to shirk your duties for the Lord? How about uh, let's talk about this for a minute? How about your commitment to finish what you have started in regard to your training for future ministry? Now here we are. We're in the first couple days of March already. This is the time of year when uh, the new semester is no longer the new semester. We're right right about at the middle point of it, and uh, and things start to get a little old. Amen. Some of that's normal for all of us. Uh, but from the start of the second semester till we get to spring break is, is a pretty good stretch of time, and things become a little bit monotonous, you know. The schedule demands are relentless. Your professors are unmerciful, and, and uh, I know because I are one, amen. But, uh, you know, what happens is we begin to focus on the circumstances, and we take our eyes off the Lord. And uh, I often think about it like this. Can you, can you imagine any set of circumstances that could be arranged in your life today that would cause you to quit serving the Lord? And uh, I mean drop out of school, drop out of church, the whole nine yards. Can you think of any set of circumstances that would cause you to do that, to quit school, not finish your training? I'll let you in on a little secret. If you can anticipate such a, a set of circumstances... Don't you think that our adversary, the devil, could arrange those circumstances in your life if God would permit him to, like he did with Job, you know? The, the whole idea is this. We, what we do, uh, what do we do when we find ourselves focusing on the problems and the people and the hassles and, and all that stuff and, and taking our eyes off the Lord? And by the way, we all get into that scenario from time to time. What are we to do? We just simply need to get our hearts right repent of our wrong focus and our wrong attitude, get our love relationship, that's what we're talking about this morning, God's love, get God, our love relationship with the Lord back where it should be and get back to the point to where we rejoice in the Lord. And, and as a result of that, what is the result of that? The result of that is it will become evident in our Christian service. It will become evident in our service to the Lord. Brother Chan McMillan uh, with Helps Ministries uh, we all know and love Brother Cham, and, and uh, Brother Cham made a statement one time that the depth of your devotional life will determine your effectiveness in, in Christian service. And boy, he's right on the money with that, isn't he? And, uh, you know, that's a pretty good indication if things aren't as they ought to be between ourselves and the Lord, what are we neglecting in that relationship? Well, first and foremost, we're probably neglecting our prayer life. We're probably neglecting our Bible time. And, uh, and, and, and all the rest of that stuff. You see, that's, th those are things that give us the strength that we need to serve the Lord. And, uh, you know, you can go soul winning without having read your Bible, without having prayed that day. You can, uh, you can work a bus route. You can do a lot of things. You can go through the motions and serve the Lord and, and, and be far away from the Lord in your heart. And, and it may not show just right away. Eventually it will. But, uh, but you can't be effective. You can't do a spiritual work without being spiritual, amen? And, uh, and so we need to get our love relationship with the Lord back where it should be. Rejoice in the Lord. Pour out our heart in service to Him. And once we learn to correct our focus and rejoice in the Lord, we will once again enjoy our service instead of enduring it, amen? If you have an eye problem this morning, try looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you have a heart problem this morning, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. All right, God's love is significant. The third thought is letter C in, in the area of security. Security, salvation, service, and now security. Look all the way down to verses 17 and 18, 1 John chapter 4 on this thought. Verse 17 and 18. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world there is no fear in love but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love God's love is significant in this thought and in this area of our life that we'll talk about here called security 
as we've discussed, many Christians, as you well know, start out well in their Christian experience, but occasionally some of them fall by the wayside, don't they? And uh, you always got to wonder why. The reason, uh, quite often, is a wrong concept of God's love. People that, uh, you know, they, they fall into some sin or they fail in some God-given responsibility. Uh, they figure, you know, God can no longer use them because they failed. And so, fearful of offending the Lord even more or facing others, they just, they just quit. A right understanding of God's love, however, eliminates that fear and gives security even in the midst of failure. I think I can relate this best perhaps by uh, just reminding ourselves of, of, of our relationship with our parents. I, I, you know, my parents have been in heaven for a number of years now, but uh, when I was a teenager, like most teenagers, I did some things at times that really aggravated my mom and dad, you know. And, uh, and I, I was, you know, I was obedient, and I feared my father, amen. That's the primary reason that I was obedient. But, uh, uh, but you know, and, and I, I never did do anything all that outrageous. But, uh, and I was in church, and I was, uh, you know, doing my best to live for the Lord and so forth. But, but uh, there were a few times, I'm sure, that I caused them a great amount of heartache. And uh, my father, I'll give him credit, he was always up for the challenge, amen. <laughs> And uh, even though there were a few times I felt the full extent of his anguish and wrath over some fool thing that I had done, I always knew that he loved me, amen? And uh, there were a couple times I thought maybe that would be my final thought here on this li in this life, uh, you know, but, but I knew that he loved me, even though I had disappointed him and hurt him. And uh, God is the same way in his dealings with his children. Uh, think about it like this, for starters, we don't deserve his love, amen? But he loves us anyway. Consider the fact that we are undeserving of his love. Write this statement down and think about these words for a moment. We are no more deserving of his love when we succeed. We are no more deserving of his love when we succeed than when we fail. Because no one deserves his love. We are no more deserving of his love when we succeed than when we fail because no one deserves his love. But he loved us anyway, didn't he? Thank the Lord for that. We are no more deserving of his love when we succeed than when we fail because no one deserves his love. He loved us when we were unlovely. And even though we're now saved, I got news for you, we're still unlovely, aren't we? We're still undeserving of his love. And when the Father looks at us, what's he see? He sees the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ in our lives. Thank the Lord for that. Uh, and, and he chooses to love us. God's love never changes. His love is always the same. So when we fall short of what we should be, and that's pretty much every day, isn't it? God still loves us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He wants us, uh, he wants us to make things right with him and to continue serving him. All right, that brings me to Roman numeral 5 now in our outline. Our love to him. Our love to him. And we're going to see some thoughts on that here at the end of the chapter, verse number 19. It's kind of a short verse, but it says it all. We love him because he first loved us. Our love to him, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. You know, you cannot possibly study this subject, God's love, and we think about God's love that has been demonstrated toward man, you cannot possibly study God's love to man without quickly becoming well aware of the fact that our love for him, even at its very best, quickly pales in comparison to God's love for us. There is no comparison between the two. As we've already seen, God's love and man's love are not the same. They're nowhere close to being on the same level. God, think about it like this. God deliberately chose to love the unlovely. God deliberately chose to love the undeserving. That's us. There was nothing good in man that attracted God's love. God had to make a willful choice to love us. Write that statement down. God had to make a willful choice 
to love us. God had to make a willful choice to love us. He loves us by choice. Man cannot love as God loves. We have to have a reason to love. There must be something lovable in the objects we love. Therefore, it stands to reason when you consider the glory of God, he should be the one person in our lives that we love the most. Now, we've talked about this before, I think. But let's talk about priorities of life here just for a minute. Then we'll get into the sub points of this, uh, of this part of our, of our notes here. Priorities of life. The number one priority in the life of every Christian is our walk with God, isn't it? It's our daily walk with the Lord. It's our relationship with Him. It's our fellowship with Him. That's number one. Number two on our list will depend upon where we are and what stage of life we're in. Uh, At my age, of course, I've been married now for 32 years. And uh, and so after my relationship with the Lord, the next most important relationship in my life, of course, is is my wife. And uh, the Lord has to come first. I cannot be the type of husband, the type of individual, the type of spiritual leader I should be in my home if things aren't right between me and the Lord. And so, number one on my list, and on your list, I would think and hope, would be your walk with God. Number two on my list is my relationship with my wife. Number three on my list is relationship with my children, and now my grandchildren. I've got five grandchildren. I got two on the way, and uh, and so and I got one already in heaven. So I, I've got a, uh, responsibilities there, of course, as the uh, as the head of my home, as the spiritual leader of my family, and so forth. And uh, I can't be what I need to be for my children if things aren't right between mom and me, amen? And uh, you know the old saying, if mom's not happy, nobody's happy. Well, amen. I can attest to that fact, all right, so many, many times. But uh, (laughs) I cannot be what I need to be for my children if things aren't right with the wife. I can't be right with the children if things aren't right between me and the Lord. I can't be what I need to be for those grandchildren if things aren't right between me and, and their parents. And, uh, and then the next thing on my list, of course, are the, the ministries, the responsibilities God has given me in service to him. We've talked about that before. Some people would say, oh, no, uh, uh-uh. you know, that, that stuff comes first. Well, I can't help you much if I don't have things right with the Lord in my own heart. And if things aren't right at home, then I'm not going to be much help to you here or anywhere else in the Lord's work. That's just the way I see it, and that's the way I practice it in my life. And so we, we must realize that the one who should be uh, the one we love the most, of course, is the Lord. All right, sub so point A, the basis of our love to him. The basis of our love to him. To love him, well, for starters, we must know him. Remember the verse we wrote the other day, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Uh, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and what? And knoweth God. And uh, he that loveth not knoweth not God, the scripture says, for God is love. To love him, we must know him. Think back over all that we have learned this semester in talking about the nature and the character of God in these last few weeks. Uh, God's love for us, I want you to write this statement down, God's love for us is seen in the understanding, God's love for us is seen in the understanding that God has a plan for each of our lives. God's love for us is seen in the understanding that God has a plan for each of our lives. God's love for us is seen in the understanding that God has a plan for each of our lives. Here's the rest of the statement. A perfect plan for us to know him, a perfect plan for us to know him and to serve him in the center of his will. A perfect plan for us to know him and to serve him in the center of his will. God's love for us is seen in the understanding that God has a plan for each of our lives, a perfect plan for us to know him and to serve him in the center of his will. Now, as we have seen, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, provided the way for us to obtain that perfect will of God by going to the cross of Calvary 
and making it possible for us to know God in the first place. God's Holy Spirit then performs God's plan and empowers us to accomplish God's will. God has done his part. At this point, our responsibility, our personal responsibility, comes into the picture. To do God's will and to value God's will as we should in our lives, we must be close to the Lord. We must be holy. Amen? Before we can be holy and practice holiness, we must love him. Yet yeah, we cannot love him if we do not know him. So we've got to run that thing in reverse. All right, the basis of our love to him. Letter B, the nature of our love to him. The nature of our love to him. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 37 and verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord. How often do we do that, huh? Psalm 37, 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord. You see, the nature of love consists in delighting ourselves, delighting the object of our love. Just as a, a newly married couple delights in their newfound love, we are to delight ourselves in the Lord. All right? So we are to um, uh, understand the nature of our love to Him. It's not a selfish desire for what we get out of it. It's what pleases the Lord. What would the Lord have me do? Amen? All right, let her see the quality of our love to Him. The quality of our love to Him. As I said a moment ago, it's not enough to simply say that we love God. I believe there are some specific qualities that are found in sincere love to God as given in the scriptures. All right, and I'm going to give you about a half a dozen of them here. Let's put that down as a heading under item C. Six qualities that are found in sincere love to God. Six qualities that are found in sincere love to God as given in the scriptures. Six qualities that are found in sincere love to God as given in the scriptures. All right, number one, the first quality and sincere love to God. Number one, we love God with our whole heart. We love God with our whole heart. We find that in the Old Testament. We find that in the New Testament, don't we? Matthew 22, verse 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. You get the impression, you get the idea from the Scripture that God doesn't want half-hearted commitments from us. God wants our whole heart. Amen? Amen. And uh, we cannot divide our love between him and the things of this world. God is a jealous God. He wants our whole heart between him and, and sin. We, got, we, we can't divide ourselves like that. We can't divide our love for the Lord in that way. God refuses to share any part of his majesty with the objects of this world and uh, the temporary things of this world. That's why he told the people of Israel, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he told them, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's one of the reasons, and maybe the number one reason, why God so hated idolatry, because it drew his people away from him. Number two, we are to love God with, uh, let's just add on to the first one, we love God with all our heart, soul, and might. That's number two. We love God with all our heart, soul, and might. We love God with all our heart, soul, and might. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. That simply means that we love the Lord as much as we are able to do so. Certainly he deserves our love and we can never love God as much as he deserves. Number three, we love God for who he is and what he is. We love God for who he is and what he is. We love God for who he is and what he is. Psalm chapter 18 and verse number 1. Psalm 18 verse 1, the psalmist says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Write this statement down. We must love God for what he is in himself. We must love God for what he is in himself, not just because of what he does for us. 
we must love God for what he is in himself, not just because of what he does for us. We must love God for what he is in himself, not just because of what he does for us. All right, number four. We love God by laboring for him. We love God by laboring for him. Well, the Bible talks about that in this context. It uses three words. It calls it a labor of love. Amen? Is that our attitude toward our Christian service today, a labor of love? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. We love the Lord by laboring for him. As we have learned, love is not just words. It is also action. Amen? Yes. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. Number five, we must love God preeminently. We must love God preeminently. We must love God preeminently. Take this in the right way, but here's the question. How's your love life this morning? Amen? <laughs> the Lord should be the number one priority of our life and of our love. Finally, number six, we must love God constantly. We must love God constantly. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. We must love God constantly. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 17 through 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. All right, number six, we must love God constantly. Again, that reference was Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. No, I didn't give you one for that one, okay? All right, now we're talking about uh, our love to Him. Our subpoints have been subpoint A, the basis of our love to Him, B, the nature of our love to Him, letter C, the quality, these six qualities that we've talked about of our love to Him. Now we're ready for letter D, the visible signs, the visible signs of our love to him. The visible signs of our love to him. If we truly love the Lord, it will be evident, and there will be, I'm going to give you seven visible signs of that love. And these will be your subpoints under letter D, numbers one through seven. The visible signs of our love to him. Seven visible signs of that love. First of all, number one, our desire will be after him. Our desire will be after him. The psalmist said in Psalm 42 and verse 2, My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. Our desire will be after him. Psalm 42 and verse 2. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 8 says, The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse number 8. Think about it from that perspective. Those who truly love folks desire to be in their presence. Amen? Those who truly love the Lord desire to be in his presence. They love to spend time with him. They love to spend time in his word. They love to be in God's house and fellowship with God's people. And uh, I tell you what, last night was such a blessing. I, I was uh, doing some studies, and I had the radio station on, you know, right there next to me and, and uh, keeping up with the restore -thon and praying for the success of that and praying for the folks that are involved there. And, and uh, it just doesn't get any better than that, to be in fellowship with the Lord, to be in fellowship with God's people. And, uh, and, you know, and we should love to communicate with him through prayer and song and the preaching and teaching of his word. 
On the other side of the coin, when we fail to enjoy those things as we should, when we have taken our focus off the Lord, uh, then those things don't bring the joy in our life that they should. I think probably every parent has had, has had this scenario come about, and, and every Christian has too. You know, uh, I remember when my children, my older children, were younger, uh, we we had a, a a week of revival or something, you know, and a Bible conference or something. So we had church every night for several nights in a row, and uh, and we're at the dinner table one evening, and and uh, and of course, you know, eating a little bit early to get to church on time, and. And one of my children looks over at me and says, Dad, do we have to go to church again tonight? <laughs> and I said, no, we get to go to church again tonight. Amen? <laughs> and, uh, and we all need a little help with that every now and then. We've got to keep those things in proper focus. When we fail to enjoy the things of the Lord, then we've taken our focus off the Lord, and it's time to repent and get right. Number two, Here's the next, uh, next thought here regarding the visible signs of our love for him. Number two, we cannot find contentment in anything without him. We cannot find contentment in anything without him. Contentment. That means satisfaction, doesn't it? That means fulfillment. It doesn't just mean temporary pleasure. It means, it means fulfillment, uh, satisfaction. We cannot find contentment in anything without him. Here's a good quote for you. I don't know where it came from. Someone as well said, and, and write this down. Here's a little definition of contentment. Contentment is realizing that God has provided everything I need. Contentment is realizing that God has provided everything I need for my present happiness. That's pretty good, isn't it? Contentment is realizing that God has provided everything I need for my present happiness. In spite of our circumstances in life, in spite of the adversities that we face, there's a contentment that God and only God can provide. A place of peace that, that's safe from the, from the storms of life. And boy, we have those things, don't we? and uh, the struggles of life. It's a place that we learn to enter as we grow in faith in, in the Lord. It's not necessarily a, a, a tangible place, a physical place, but it's a place that exists in our hearts, isn't it? And uh, even though we sometimes, uh, you know, become subject to difficulties and trials and, and difficult circumstances, we can have that peace in our heart of knowing, hey, God's in charge here, you know. Even though I don't understand what's going on, I don't understand, I don't know the answer to this situation necessarily, but I know God knows the answer. And that, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do that would please you in this circumstance? And uh, I'll, I'll close out our class this morning by giving this little illustration. M many years ago, when my oldest daughter, uh, Sonia, she'll, she'll be, uh, this month's her birthday, she'll be 28 years old this, this month. And... Uh, when she was just a little girl, not even uh, not even two years old, probably, it was about this time of the year. I was uh, it was a Saturday afternoon. I'd, I'd, I was a bus captain in those days. I'd worked my bus route, got home, and I was uh, in the backyard uh, putting together a garden. It's that time of the year here in Central Florida, and so my wife and, and Sonia was our only child at that time. And uh, Beth, there's like two years difference uh, between them. And so uh, I'm in the backyard working, and my wife comes flying into the driveway on two wheels, blowing the horn, you know. And I'm wondering, what in the world? And she gets out of the car, and she's in tears, and she's upset. And uh, being a man, my first thought was, she wrecked my car. Oh, my goodness, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just explain to you how things work, ladies, all right? <laughs> that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Sonia was in the front seat, and she was in the midst of some kind of a seizure of some sort. It's the only way I know to explain it. I mean, she wasn't convulsing or anything like that, but she was, her eyes were open, but nobody was home, you know? And uh, she's been that way for the rest of her life, too, if you know my daughter very well. But, but uh, seriously, uh, it was a scary thing for for uh, relatively new parents like us. 
And uh, I mean, she, she wouldn't talk. She just, you know, she was almost like subconscious, but her eyes were open, scared the life out of us. And uh, man, I jumped in there and Richard Petty would have been proud of me, buddy, I'm telling you. We set a new land speed record between our place. We lived up the other side of Davenport in those days, all the way to uh, the hospital in Winter Haven. And we got over there and they checked her out and they admitted her to the hospital, kept her for two or three days and, and, uh, and, and everything worked out okay. Um, it, it just something that happened. It, it got, you know, she was ill and, and, and was apparently running a, a, a temperature, a, a fever. And that's what caused her body to do that. And uh, it's like, you know, you're sick. I'm just going to go on and keep on going. And, you know, your body may just simply say, you do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to lay over here on the, on the ground for a while, you know. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what happened to her, you know. <laughs> and so um, I don't have time to tell you all the rest of that story. But in the midst of that, of that trial, you know, we're, man, I mean, I, I'm, I'm praying, you know, and I'm, and I'm trusting the Lord. And... Uh, and, and driving down the road like a maniac, you know. And my wife's there, and she's all upset. She's holding the baby. And uh, the Lord just gave me, <laughs> he just gave me peace in my heart. You know, that's the only way I know to say it. He just gave me peace in my heart that everything was going to be okay, you know. I reached over and took my wife by the hand, and I told her, I said, it's going to be all right, you know. Let's just trust the Lord. And it, and it all worked out, you know, for his, for his glory. But uh, even in the midst of, of trials and tribulation and adversity, we can have that contentment in our heart and knowing that God's in charge, you know. And uh, uh, even if that little girl had died that day, God still would have been in charge, right? And, uh, and, and so we must subject ourselves and submit ourselves to, to his leading and to his will. All right, that's our time today. We'll get back to it again on Monday. Thank you. You're dismissed. <laughs>